Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Dr. Christopher Avery is the founder and CEO of The Responsibility Company, one of the go-to organizations for executive leadership development and change management training. They have been in business for over 30 years. What makes them different is they teach their clients the responsibility process, a unique and thoroughly researched approach to teamwork and leadership, which they can use to lead themselves and others to results that matter. The responsibility process has been used by leaders at top companies, including Microsoft, Whole Foods Market, Verizon, PayPal, eBay, and Wells Fargo. Dr. Christopher is an author who has written two books. Teamwork is an individual skill, which shows readers how to develop skills that will enable them to thrive in any team and under any circumstances. And the responsibility process, unlocking your natural ability to live and lead with power. This book offers practices obtained from 25 years of applied research on responsibility taking and leadership. Christopher is also a speaker who is popular with audiences interested in agility, effective leadership, and results that benefit an organization and its employees. Our interview will continue after messages from our sponsors. Have you been wanting to launch your podcast and just haven't found the right resources? I launched Master Leadership Podcast in 2016, and it now ranks in top 1% globally. I've gathered all I've learned and created Master Your Podcast in a Weekend course on Master Your Swag app so that you have everything you need to share your voice with the world, minus those excuses. So download Master Your Swag app on Google or Apple platforms to access the Master Your Podcast course and launch your podcast this weekend. Welcome, Dr. Christopher Avery. How are you? Thank you very much, Lily. I'm pleased to be here. And to answer your question, I am free, powerful, and at choice. Thank you. How are you? (laughs) I love that. I am free, powerful, and at choice as well. We're excited to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Christopher, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. That was an interesting question to me because, you know, my path to leadership, my early experiences in leadership were what I would call, you know, organizational titles. So Boy Scouts, paramilitary stuff, and then student government in college and high school, student body president, and then department manager. And, you know, I don't know if that's really leadership or if it's just seeking status or challenge or management. To me, and this is based on 30 years of studying personal responsibility, to me, leadership is responsibility, period. Love it. Mm -hmm. So leadership is a byproduct of someone in pursuit of a goal larger than them and requiring help. Ooh. Right. So for me, I've got a doctorate in organization science and leadership. You know, like you, I've studied leadership widely. But the more I study personal responsibility, the more I believe that true leadership is simply pointing yourself in the direction of some huge problem that you see nobody else doing anything about and that you believe that you can bring something to it. And since it's huge, it requires more than you. So your behavior actually attracts collaboration or followers. To me, that's true leadership. And I love that word, responsibility. And it takes a lot of work to get to that place of taking responsibility, right? Well, yes and no. It's easy to take responsibility for stuff that we're good at or the good stuff in our lives under our arms and say, I did that. 
responsibility, according to Socrates and all the gurus who say that taking personal responsibility is the first key to success in any endeavor, what it means is the ability to respond to failure, the ability to respond to the mountain in front of you, the ability to respond to falling down. It's about your ability to respond. Right. And we're not taught that. That skill is not brought out in us, in our education system and, and by our parents, but it's there in every person. And my work has been to study the psychology of personal responsibility and how it works in our minds. That's really interesting. And my experience has been that most people don't get this deep until they've been deep in their own lives. Like something happened. Um, and so I'm trying to get to what happened in your life that brought this deep awareness to you and then instilled this responsibility to bring it to other people. Good question. So there's the kind of appropriate answer and then there's the more juicy answer. We like both. <laughs> but juicy especially. <laughs> so the juicy answer is that I learned when I was pretty young that I was a little messed up and that I had some behavior that I didn't like. Specifically, I was very judgmental. I could be very demeaning and critical of people and chop them to their knees very quickly. And I learned when I was 18, 20 years old that I didn't like that and I couldn't change it in myself. It was so deep. It was somewhere in my systems, deep in the subconscious, whatever, that, you know, just learning the behavioral conditioning skills of teaching a dog to sit up and bark, you know, that I tried to change myself didn't work. So I started a pursuit of what I call my own integrity at a pretty early age. And that eventually led me to this responsibility process model that I've now been working with for many years. And it helped me find those answers. So that's the juicy part of my own growth as a human being and my own finding my core and my ability to pluck out deeply embedded beliefs that were not serving me. We call them yuck berries. Just yuck, some yuck berries, stuff. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the more uh, acceptable answer is that I was trying to figure out how to teach shared responsibility to project team leaders, to software developers in a consulting project to IBM years ago. And so I went in search of understanding what is this stuff called personal responsibility. So, you know, when teams come together, I see shared responsibility emerges. And if shared responsibility doesn't emerge, then teams don't tend to come together. So a team for me is a group that steps up to a, an opportunity for shared responsibility. And I wanted to figure out how to teach software project leaders how to understand that and what that meant. And that's what led me to the research on the responsibility process that shows the psychology of responsibility and how it works in our mind and how we avoid taking ownership for the crap in our lives and how we can take ownership of it and change it. And so I clearly see that behind you, that uh, diagram, the responsibility process. So walk us through what this is. Sure. So if you're listening to this, you're not seeing the diagram, but I'm going to give you a stack of five words or phrases. One of them is a phrase. And the stack starts at the bottom with lay blame. And above lay blame is justify. Above justify is shame. Above shame is obligation. Above obligation is a line, and above that line is the word responsibility. And Lily, what these are, these are all mental states that this research over the last about 35 years has identified. And the pattern to them is that every time something goes wrong in our life, the responsibility process gets triggered and our mind goes to lay blame. Hmm. And the cause effect logic in lay blame is who did this to me, right? I'm at effect and someone else is the cause. Right. And for my effect to change, for me to be happier, more successful, whatever, then somebody else must change. Let me go through the others real quickly and then I'll tell you a little bit about how they relate. Justify is very much like blame, except instead of blaming a person, we're blaming circumstances, a situation weather, traffic, time, budget, process, 
uh, culture. Yeah, I'm sure we're all very familiar with that. Yeah, justify is pernicious. It's really, really yeah. sneaky. So you'd think smart people like you and me who've been taught all our lives that we shouldn't blame or make excuses, you'd think we'd get past doing these things. And what our research shows is that this pattern in our minds is wired and we will never get rid of this pattern in our minds. All we can do is learn to be aware of it and work with it as a signal in our mind about how we're responding so that we can get off of that mental state. What our research shows is that the smarter we are, the better stories we tell. Ha. Huh. <laughs> so, so if we stop making it about our circumstances or conditions then the next thing that happens is we blame ourselves so it goes from an external pointer to pointing internal and saying well if you're not going to point anything out there then the only one left is you it's you're the dummy you're the dolt so we call that shame usually experiences guilt and our society is really good about teaching us to heap that on ourselves it's also in a different color on the responsibility process chart because that's where society differs from this research. This society and this research both agree that blaming and justifying are powerless. It's giving our power away. Society teaches us that if we're beating ourselves up, we're quote, being a good person. We're taking responsibility by beating ourselves up. And they say, oh, good girl, she's taking responsibility. And then if we stop beating ourselves up for having a problem or making a mistake, then we graduate to obligation, which is the mental state of being trapped. It's the mental state of have to, don't want to. The feeling is being burdened, right? So I have to go to my boss's stupid meeting. I have to go to this kid's thing after school. You know, I'd love to go get a cold frosty beverage with you, but I have a kid thing I have to do. I have to go to my in-laws for holiday. I have to pay the bills. I have to go to the grocery store. I have to go to the bathroom. And society teaches us that obligation is responsibility, that if we're doing what we're supposed to do, even if we hate it. <laughs> we're good citizens. <laughs> that we're good citizens. We're good, responsible people. And our research says that, yes, we can be good citizens because we've conformed to expectations of society. So check the box on our character, but we can be good citizens without taking 100% responsibility for our lives. Right. And so in shame and obligation, we still have the predominant amount of our focus or attention on our powerlessness to enact any change. So for us, that can't be responsibility. So it's only when we decide to stop feeling trapped, when we refuse to remain trapped, then we cross this line into the mental state of responsibility. And the difference here is that below the line, all those mental states have really simplistic mechanistic cause effect logic in them. Above the line, we have access to amazing resourcefulness and amazing probabilistic reasoning and amazing complex adaptive skills to take ownership of anything and either change it or totally accept it and not have any angst about having it in our lives. So that's the responsibility process. Find out more at responsibility.com and download the poster and take our responsibility quiz right from the homepage. Oh, juicy. Yes. All right. And so um, on the other side, though, on the right side, you have two other words, denial. And as we go up, quit. Tell us yeah, about that's that. going to take about 10 more interviews. To oh, go through okay. Those, so. All right. So they should tune into your website, responsibility.com. Beautiful. Yeah. Now you said something that we're hardwired for justifying shame, uh, the whole left side of that chart. Could we be taught otherwise? Like if we have parents who are very intentional <laughs> and very tuned into your process, could we kind of flip the switch? So you mentioned intentional. Right. So here's our understanding. Our understanding is that this process is as it is in every human being before birth, regardless of age, education, intelligence, anything okay. else, culture. So it's just a signal device. And that's the key, right? Is I know this is in me. I know this is how my mind is designed to react to things going wrong. It thinks it's probably protecting me or keeping me safe by blaming or justifying. But if I can be aware enough 
of what's going on in my mind to catch myself there. And if I realize that simply having an intention to not stay there will make me graduate upwards. Beautiful. Then that's the fast path to responsibility. So I've been practicing this for 30 years. And today, still things go wrong every day, all day long. Yet I get from blame to responsibility in half a second. Beautiful. Where others get stuck in blame for a year or 10 years or right. a lifetime. So that's our understanding. The other ways that you can modify this is, yes, if you grow up in a family where mom and dad or dad and dad or mom, you know, whatever, where your parents practice very high levels of responsibility, then you too will simply learn through the skin to let go of blame, to let go of justify, to let go of beating yourself up in shame, to let go of obligation. The same is true in a culture, organizational culture, I want to talk about school systems with you too, because I know that's a, an interest of yours. So yeah. if you live in a culture that's very toxic, that's very blaming, and you know, if everything that you can do is a mistake and get in trouble for, then you're going to live at the bottom of the scale in order to survive in that culture, in order to be safe, right? And the most responsible people are going to see that and leave, right? They don't stay around more than a couple of weeks. Right. And yet, if you build an extremely healthy culture of high levels of freedom and autonomy, freedom, choice, and power, right, That's right. then you're very naturally going to gravitate towards the top of this chart. And you don't even need to know anything about the responsibility process. It's natural. All we've done is identify a natural process that's happening in all of us. So long answer to your question. We don't think you can avoid the process, but your own awareness and intention can navigate it and a cultural system can set you up for high levels of success and happiness as well. And it takes intentionality. Like when I think of school systems, I think of systems organizations, if leadership takes this level of responsibility, it does shift the culture from toxicity. Like there, you know, sometimes we feel like it's toxic. It can never change because we're so in it. But tapping into your resources, tapping into your website, what you have to offer really gives us tools to up level that and gives us hope. I hope isn't a plan, but damn, it's necessary. I agree with that. So I mostly work for people who are in a position of buck stops here. So often CEOs, CIOs. Decision makers, um, right. You know, yeah, I'll come and do a speech or a workshop, but if you want me to actually engage with you over time to change your team or organization, then we have to make a very important agreement first. And that is that you stop blaming your people. Love it. The number one coping mechanism in every organization is that managers blame the people and people blame their managers. And that's just living at the bottom of this chart. That's all. It's, it's human nature. We blame when we don't know what to do about it. So what that conversation does with that leader is to say, look, it's your system. I even want to interject an invective there. You know, <laughs> it's, your, it's your darn system. If there's something in it that you don't like, guess who gets to take ownership of that? That's right. You said something at the very beginning, too, that oftentimes we look for causes that are outside of us, right? And I think of my life. I am the cause of my life. Yes. We look at cause and effect, and so often we fall on the effect side of it, you know, and woe is me. But to take responsibility that way, to see that we are the cause, also gives us a freedom. It interjects power, and then we're at choice as well. And so I love what you're doing here, Chris. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate that. And yes, that's why when someone says, how are you? My answer is I'm free, powerful, and at choice. It's not because I always feel that way, Lily, and it's not because I felt that way when I started answering. It's because I know it's true even when I don't feel that way. Beautiful. So it's an affirmation that I get to use multiple times a day to remind <laughs> myself, oh yeah, I always am free, powerful, and at choice, even right. when I'm sure I'm not. You know, I have a list of I am statements and I'm going to include this one in there until my affirmation becomes a confirmation, which I love. All right. I so, share that language. I have a list of I ams as well. Beautiful. All right. So as a lifelong learner, what are you learning right now? For about a year or two, I've been very intrigued with metaphysics and that's what I'm studying. 
in particular, the idea of metaphysics is that what's really going on is beyond the physical, beyond the domain of Newtonian cause and effect, beyond the domain of linear logic. What's really going on is energetic or in consciousness. So metaphysical beyond the physical. So and quantum stuff. So in physics, the quantum stuff is really interesting. There's a guy whose books I'm reading. Uh, the most recent one is The Grand Biocentric Design by David Lenz. I could be wrong about that. He's a guy with amazing credentials. And he keeps summarizing every year or two the recent research on what he calls biocentrism. Biocentrism would be the alternative to realism. Realism has been the basics of physics for eons. And realism says that the universe and the moon and stars and earth and planets and trees all exist whether or not you and I are here. Biocentrism is based on lots of emerging research and data that suggests that none of it exists without our consciousness. In other words, we as humanity are somehow creating all of this. I That's pretty that. wild. I love this. We can actually go down the rabbit hole. We won't. But I have a new book to read. Grand Biocentric Design. Thank you. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate that. I mean, I love reading stuff like this. A lot of it I don't understand, but there are things that do sink in, especially as I have conversations with people like yourself. So, so that's the quantum physics research side of it. I'm really fascinated with the consciousness or spirituality side of that. And the person I would recommend starting with there many of your listeners probably already know, is Dr. David Hawkins. So he's both an MD and a PhD. And if you can read some tough to read stuff, I would start with his book called Power Versus Force. If you want to go a little lighter, go into Audible and get some of his Nightingale Conant. So Nightingale Conant did a bunch of tapes of Hawkins lectures and appearances. And he's very funny and witty and very accessible in those audio tapes. His books are much more like dissertations and they're heavy reading. I'm actually getting into Neville and his work, which is very spiritual and heady too. And this is all part of leadership. This is all part of getting to know ourselves as humans so that we can, you know, equip ourselves so that we can up level how we show up and help up level others. Sure. So I stopped trying to lead anybody a long time ago. And I learned about collaboration and I learned what it took to attract people to me as collaborators, what I call integrative skills. And then I decided that this responsibility material was the most important stuff I knew and had to share. And nobody else was doing anything about it, about trying to shift how the planet thought about personal responsibility. So I just challenged myself to see if I could play with this stuff and if money would come to me, if I would earn a living. And so it's a huge problem that no one else is taking ownership of. It's a wide open space for me to step into and do something about. And now I have a worldwide following of thousands of people who are passing out posters and teaching responsibility and little conference groups and things like that. So how did I attract them? So part of this metaphysics, the beyond the physical, is that our thoughts are magnets, as you know, I can tell from language here. And that means I might be attracting people to me, not because of the messaging precisely or the social media work that I do, just because we're connected at some kind of a level of frequency that has us show up in the same conference space or Love the it. same podcast or somewhere else at the same time. So that would be an example of the metaphysics of leadership. Beautiful. I really can talk for hours on this. We will focus. All right. So Christopher, when you think of leadership today, what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? Uh, what most concerns me is a phrase that comes out of scholarly literature called destructive leadership, which is defined as any activity of a person in a leadership position, leadership role, that I'm paraphrasing this, that reduces the humanity of others. And one of the things that I've railed against for a long time, Lily, is defining leadership as influence. 
Mm. It's not because I don't think that leadership isn't influence. It's because I think parroting that gives people permission to be manipulative, dishonest, controlling, et cetera, in order to, quote, influence other people. And what I'm most hopeful about is finding new threads, like the thread I put out there, that maybe leadership isn't necessarily about skills or behaviors. Maybe leadership is really about taking ownership of something that's bigger than me and requiring help. I'm hopeful or maybe about... a combination of both of those, right? Right. Because if you take responsibility, that's great. But if you don't have the skills to connect with people, then you don't work on that. I think they can develop simultaneously. And I, I think that's important. I'm not opposed to that. And I think that there are plenty of people who tackled big problems that were introverts right. um, and attracted people to them and didn't have amazing people skills. So it's one of those interesting areas that attracts lots of people like you and me into. And there's as many views about what leadership is and isn't as there are of us experts in the space looking at it. Yeah. So I actually was really accosted with a debate by someone once at a conference who said, why don't you just get off this leadership crap stuff and let's just talk about citizenship. I go, you know, I think maybe you're right. It's really semantics too. Because when I think of leadership, I take responsibility. I need to lead myself well first. You started this conversation with, I had organizational titles. And that's typically where we encounter leadership. And typically what we encounter is that we lack skills because our school systems don't teach it. And to me, leadership skills are really social emotional skills. And let's look at school systems, right? I've been approached by boards to bring the responsibility process in. And my first meeting with them is they're just odd. So they invite me to come back another time, the next meeting, so that they can debate it and figure out how to bring this into the school system. And by the next meeting, they've cooled down. And the reason is that what in the school systems is generally called responsibility in this process is called shame and obligation. And what I call responsibility, they see in a school system as anarchy. And when it starts with them, right? Because it always starts with them taking the responsibility. It shifts things. So I would work with the school system if I could work with maybe the board for six months or a year. Yes. And And then then with the administration for another six months or a year. Before we ever get anywhere close to the teacher's and the staff and the students. Beautiful. And it would have to be a cascading process of culture change, language change, personal practice, et cetera. You know, I appreciate that you don't compromise that. And that's happened to me where you bring powerful, transformative information and they want to change it to fit their mold. And I won't compromise on that. So, you know, you, can give, you. you can give and take, but you know what it takes to really dig into the system and cause transformation. You know, I remember in ed leadership courses, that term at that time was transformation, transformation. And I remember asking a professor, what is transformation? And he couldn't give me a straight response. (laughs) So that was interesting to me. I can answer. It's changing form. So to your point, thank you for noticing, Lily. So The reason that I have this stance is because I've made so many mistakes with clients in the past. And so the way that I talk about this now is that I no longer take a job from executive A that wants me to change group B because I know where the real change needs to happen. Right. Absolutely. All right. So we have a question from a former guest. Are you ready? Yes. (laughs) Are there bells or is there intro music or anything? Do I get points? I can do that. (laughs) All right. I want to give you this question from Glenn T. Campbell, who really operates in the same space with this quantum biocentric metaphysical world. It's a simple question, but deep. He wants to know who are you and why are you here? Mm. So I know the answer and it's deep and it might weird out some people. So I am simply a spirit with a body that's got a personality named Christopher. And why I'm here is to simply evolve in consciousness. This is the work that I'm doing to do that. That's right. 
I love it. And I love that you know, and I knew that you knew. That's why I asked you that. There are three questions that I ask in leadership that most leaders, when I look at leadership and education, because that's my space or in nonprofits, when I ask these questions, it's deer in the headlight. And I understand it because I was there too. So who are you? What do you desire and why? And we teach the keys to responsibility. Since you can't do anything about this process in your mind, the keys are intention, awareness, confront. Beautiful. Intention, what do you want? What's your purpose? What do you intend? Awareness. <laughs> There's no end to developing self-awareness and finding the lies in our heads and replacing them with truths as we learn them. And confront means simply the willing to face ourselves, willingness to face our anxiety, willingness yeah. to face our fear. Yeah. Beautiful. And that is, to me, high-level leadership and what leadership should be. So, Christopher, as a listener of this podcast, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? Here's a question that you might throw out to somebody, and that is, when are you going to own it all? When are you going to own that you're creating, choosing, and attracting your whole life? Wow, that's deep. When are you going to own it all? I love that question. When you download the poster, we have definitions of each of these mental states right on the poster. And the definition of responsibility is this, owning your power and ability to create, choose, and attract, period. Which means we're always creating, choosing, and attracting our reality. We're just not always owning that we're doing it. How which it goes back to what you and I talked about earlier, which is most people are willing to own the good stuff. We're just not willing to own the bad stuff. When we start owning the bad stuff, it's when we really start learning and growing. That's right. Awesome. I am so energized. Thank you. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I'll just reinforce, go to responsibly.com and, and there's a button right on the home page to take the responsibility scorecard self-assessment. And that's a really good way to start getting engaged with us. And we don't ask for your email address or anything to do that. It's just a service for the public. And after that, if you want to opt into our community and get lots of cool content from us, that'd be awesome to engage with you. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for adding so much value to me and to our listeners. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Lily. I really appreciate being here and I appreciate your approach to your podcast and to leadership and with your guests. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.